voluntary cooperation. The economic market, buying and selling, is one example, but it's only one example. Voluntary cooperation is far broader than that. To take an example that at first sight seems about as far away as you can get, the language we speak, the words we use, the complex structure of our grammar, no government bureau designed that. It arose out of the voluntary interactions of people seeking to communicate with one another. Or consider some of the great scientific achievements of our time, the discoveries of Einstein or Newton, the inventions of a Thomas Alva Edison or an Alexander Graham Bell, or even consider the great charitable activities of a Florence Nightingale or an Andrew Carnegie. These weren't done under orders from a government office. They were done by individuals deeply interested in what they were doing, pursuing their own interests and cooperating with one another. This kind of voluntary cooperation is built so deeply into the structure of our society that we tend to take it for granted. Yet the whole of our Western civilization is the unintended consequence of that kind of a voluntary cooperation, of people cooperating with one another to pursue their own inners, yet in the process building a great society. I'm Linda Chavez. Welcome to Free to Choose. Joining Dr. Friedman in a discussion of the power of the market are David Brooks of the Wall Street Journal and James Galbraith of the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Galbraith, should we follow the example of Hong Kong and simply allow an unregulated free market? I think we do better in this country uh, with the combination of uh, a free market and its advantages uh, and a well-regulated, carefully thought out structure of uh, government, which provides uh, a chance to uh, uh, pick up some of the losers from the market process and give them a second start. Provides us with a chance to make the economic process a little safer, a little healthier, a little more environmentally uh, sound and protective than you might get from uh, a uh, uh, strict adherence to the free market such as uh, Professor Friedman has described in the case of, of Hong Kong. Dr. Friedman, is there any such thing as a well-regulated market? No. He's begging the question. Obviously, he's right. If you could have a well-regulated, carefully thought out, properly done market, benevolent dictatorship is the best of all forms of government. Oh, I don't agree with that at all. Neither do constitutional I. Constitutional democracy is the best of I, all forms of government. No, constitutional democracy <coughs> is the least bad of all forms of government. But uh, you beg all the questions that's, that's when you talk about well-regulated, carefully thought out. If you look at the actual programs that government follows, they almost always have effects that they are the opposite of those that, that uh, were intended by their well-meaning advocates. Let me tell you what troubles me. I'll tell me. you something. Matching the invisible hand of government is the uh, invisible hand of the market is the invisible foot of government. You make the point in the, in the program that uh, in every case where you have uh, a smaller role of government in the freer market, you have a higher standard of living. The no, same I point. didn't say that. At the same I didn't say that. Well, I that said you are have better conditions for the poorer people. Better conditions, okay, better conditions for the poorer people, fine, I'll accept that. At the same time, you're making the argument in the program that the uh, conditions in Hong Kong are better, for example, than they are in the United States, mm -hmm. which is manifestly not true. I mean, I we do have, we do, you are making the argument, you're making the argument the that Hong Kong is more free than it we is. are. It is more free. Does it then follow that the conditions for poor people in Hong Kong are better than they are in the United States? We have to. We have to. That I don't. I, that I don't I, believe. I to said in there where you compare like with like. Well, now, okay. Well, this is an important qualification, which isn't clear Hong in the Kong, program. Uh, obviously, started mm -hmm. out from a much lower position. If I were to compare Hong Kong conditions in Hong Kong in 1945 or 1950 with conditions in the United States in 1820. 1830, you'd have a much closer comparison. But are you then saying, a uh, position which I would find much more congenial, that where you have a country which has developed a base of material wealth, uh, a degree of comfort for the average citizen, that it is then legitimate for the government of that country 
to step in and provide some guarantees and some security no, I'm for not poor saying people that. and old no people sorry. and sick I'm people. I'm not saying that at all. But why not? I mean, what, what, what's because wrong I am with, saying with, with that, that as a, as a Because as a, every as time a they step position. in to try to do that, they end up doing the opposite. Well, this discussion uh, takes up uh, or reflects a, a feature of the program that I found to be most troubling, which is a failure to make a distinction between governments of the kind that we have developed in this country over 200 years uh, and governments of the kind that you described in, uh, in, in uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, it's perfectly clear that one can have, uh, and many countries do have, the curse of repressive dictatorships. It's also perfectly clear that an economy that's organized by commissars is going to fail. And we certainly have, have, have seen the, uh, in, laid out before us over the last several years, the ashes of uh, those failed economies. But is it possible to take the example of the Soviet Union, of Poland, of Hungary, uh, and to say because their governments, which were after all uh, dictatorships modeled after, uh, after the system of government installed in the Soviet Union by Stalin, are in fact parallel to the actions of our government, which is a government which operates on many different federal levels, and where fundamentally what you have is the ability of the ordinary citizen whose power is not weighted by the amount of money he has or she has to use the vote wow. in order there to in order to in order to to make some collective decisions. Now, granted, there are thirty-four hundred pages of the years, Clean Air Act. What, where's granted, the citizen in there? Granted, after ten years of uh, of uh, uh, Reagan's Washington. You've got a problem of, uh, of uh, a serious problem of corruption uh, well, and, and, and in, our, in our democratic no, no, system. Does that mean that we should <laughs> abandon the it's idea <laughs> that you have uh, a democratic process uh, that should be entrusted with certain important decisions? You, I don't think you so. You don't have a democratic process in the sense in which you mean it. Uh, we have a democracy. We have a majority mm -hmm. rule. But the majority that rules is a collection of minorities. It's a collection of special interests. You cannot tell me that the consumers of this country would vote for a sugar quota that makes the price of sugar three times the world price. When you say you can't compare it to Russia, or to, you're quite right, but the only because they are 100% and we're 50%. Yeah, yeah. If, our, if our system, if our present regulations and rules had prevailed, if our scope of government had prevailed 100 years ago, mm -hmm. We wouldn't be where we are today. Let me understand you, Dr. Friedman. Do you believe that there should be no role at all whatsoever for government? Of course there should be a role for government. There's what a is that role? There's an important role for government. The role for government is, first of all, to protect people from coercion, by the physical coercion by their neighbors or by foreign countries. It is to protect the national defense and to protect law and order in, at home. There's a role for government in enabling us to have a mechanism whereby we decide on the rules by which we want to run how we define private property, what we mean by private property. There's a role for government in adjudicating disputes between us. There is a role for government, a very important role. And I believe our government played that role quite well for about 100 years until the Great Depression. I'd go a little further. I think there's a health and safety role as well. The, the problem is you have, to, you have to keep your regulations simple and minimal. You have to realize that there are, there are costs, and often the costs outweigh the benefits. In fact, in Washington, there are interests who want to divert costs to themselves. So there's sort of a built-in structure, a dynamic, to, to make costs outweigh the benefits. Well, we're making progress here. I would add that there's a role, the government has a role to protect the environment. I would say the government has a role to set standards for products but what in areas where information is very costly well, for the individual consumer to obtain. Uh, I like very much the fact that the steaks that that dentist was eating were inspected by the USDA. Their purity was guaranteed by a rather well-functioning uh, uh, aspect of, the, uh, of, of our government. Uh, I like... Go ahead. On the other hand, you've got the FDA, which has these long delays, 10 years to get a drug approved. So the, the effect is that you have to be a big drug company to, to get any kind of, to enter the market. And you, you basically are closing off the market. Uh, on the other hand, you have, you've had a set of regulations which uh, have disappeared without uh, any 
well-justified regrets. For example, the regulations or, or that govern the entry into interstate trucking, the regulations that govern entry and, and, and rates in and airlines. And that was done under the Reagan administration. No, 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 oh, no, oh, no. Those reforms were done under the Carter administration. Yeah.